Today on the Dolby Institute podcast, we talk with key members of the team behind Dahmer, season one of Ryan Murphy's hit television series, Monster. This is a fascinating conversation about the challenges of balancing this gripping portrayal of the monstrous serial killer and his impact on the communities that he preyed upon without glorifying or redeeming Jeffrey Dahmer in any way. I remember that we had this great shot because we refused to ever go into his POV. And we had this great shot where he looks in the mirror and we called it our taxi driver moment. And I remember saying to Regis one day, I was like, I think, it look, I think he looks too good. I, and it was as simple as that. I think he's too good looking in this moment. How can we look for another take? How can we get out of it sooner? I think that if we spend too too much time in it, what becomes sort of like the hero's gaze in a sense, that, that it starts to, you start to sympathize. Joining us is executive producer and president of Ryan Murphy Productions, Alexis Woodall, re-recording mixer, Laura Wiest, production sound mixer, Amanda Beggs, and producer and supervising editor, Regis Kimball. This is just one of two episodes we're doing on this series. So be sure to look out for our episode with Paris Barclay, who directed the remarkable episodes six and 10 of this show. But for now, let's dive into the production and post-production process of Dahmer. Alexis, I'd like, I'd love to start with you as the, as the show's executive producer. Tell us a little bit about your role in, in post-production and seeing the show through, you know, after, after principal photography and through the, the editing and the sound work and the music, uh, uh, especially. Well, you know, for all the film students out there listening, I started as a PA in post-production. So I take post very seriously. It's really important. And, and I am the executive producer who is like, whoa, 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 whoa. What about the sound? And why does that rustle? And let's think about the frame. And uh, so for a show like Dahmer, for a show like, for every show that we do, it's about how we feel, how it is incumbent upon us as a storyteller to make sure that the audience feels the way that we feel. And that is everything. That is not just script. It is not just performance. It is not just actors or it's everything. And so there's a real holistic approach that I take on with all of my shows. And with a show like Dahmer, you know, the first thing that Ryan and I do is I listen to Ryan talk about how he what's what's important about it. I take all of my tone notes from Ryan. We've been doing this dance together for a long time. And I'm very, very blessed that I have my very, very dear friend, and I consider my mentor, Regis Kimball, as my producing editor on the show. I know. Don't, don't make that face. For all you folks at home, he made a face. Um, but, uh, but Regis and I were able to get together, and we – essentially what happens, if, if, you know, if we're really breaking it down, basically we support everything, and we I deal with everything on the front end and the back end when we're in prep and when we're dealing with the writers and we're talking about story and hiring different people and thinking about, you know, whatever, my DP and I spent a lot of time breaking down what our rules were and how we were going to approach Dahmer's, um, how we were going to either get into his brain or in the situation of our show, not deliberately not attempt to get into his brain. And so what that means is you start to extrapolate out with sound and picture, where's our POV? What are the rules of the camera? And so Jason McCormick, who's brilliant, Jason and I, started working with that early on and with Regis as well, we, we absorb the tone notes, we absorb the thoughts and, and we just start making the rules and we weigh in on the dailies and, and I, you know, I'll get a call and anything from Evan needs to talk to me about something versus, you know, J- Jason, the DP needs to talk and it all comes together the same way with Ryan and everybody, but really and truly when it gets into the process is once the director's cut is done, because the director really has to have their moment to shoot the show the way that they've interpreted it in a way that they feel strongly about it. And then it comes to me and it comes to Regis and I, and we watch it and we think, what is it? What story are we telling? And I just have this very instinctive quality of, where we need to be and when and how. And it, for me, it's all about how it affects me emotionally. And whether that means on the tough shows, I'm like, let's make it tougher, which is I think what we did with Dahmer was saying, we don't want to let anybody off the hook. We don't, we're not trying to turn this into anything operatic. It was deliberately a slow choice because Ryan spoke with a certain tone note that was on us to interpret. And that was restraint and um, removal from the subject and a, a, tr- a true scrutiny of who this person is we cannot get in his head to decide why he did it but if we were to see how his actions affected other people that was where we come from so i start from my first time i watch it through i don't take any notes i just watch a cut and i just think about it and of course i'm texting regis a million things the whole time and this is what i think and you know and and it, we start i 
think it's like building a house or building anything. You start with page one, scene one, and you watch it. And how, how do we move the camera in the scene? And do we need to cut? And what does it sound like? And is it hot outside? And can we get that feeling in the air? And I remember one of the things that Regis and Jason and Ryan and I, and we all talked about a lot was the fish tank, that the fish tank needed to smell and be putrid and fetid and the house needed to feel gross. And our director, Carl Franklin, especially in the first episode, took such pains to carefully and cautiously cover and, and show us the world. And then suddenly it was like, well, is the, I, I speak about sound specifically since we're on a Dolby conversation, but we just, we talked about like that buzz of the, of the refrigerator and what's happening with the fish tank. And I will never forget that the very first time I watched the director's cut, the visceral reaction I had to taking the vat lid off. And I know it was just biscuits and gravy that we used on set in our vat, but it was so it was so putrid that I felt it. I know how, I mean, I literally know how the sausage is made and there was sausage in there and I could not get over how it felt and how it smelled. And so it's really a testament to every single department thinking about what are the tone notes, what makes this show special. Uh, I think Amanda recorded the sound on set beautifully. I think that the production sound really was a standout for for so many reasons. And it was not too, it was clean, but not too crisp. It felt like you were in the room with them and it gave us a lot of room to play. And I think that, you know, visually it was about removing. It's always about sculpting and ideally subtracting rather than inventing and rather than solving. So that's a very long answer for your very short question, but I, I can obviously talk for a while. So I'm going to hand the mic over to someone else. Regis, what, I mean, what do you think? Or Glenn, I guess, go back to you. No, uh, Alexis, look, that was brilliant. I, you, you very successfully teed up so many of the things that I want to talk about. So I, I'll, I'll go into some follow up questions. You know, one of the things that from a thematic standpoint, I, I really wanted to ask you about is, you know, you, you, you've said a couple of times that it was very important for you and for Ryan <clears throat> Murphy, the, 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 the show creator, that you didn't want to go inside Dahmer's head. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to follow up with that. You know, one of the things that I noticed right away about the show is that Dahmer is, he's a tough character. He's so inscrutable. He's not, he's not charismatic, kind of the way you paint John Wayne Gacy, who, who shows up briefly in the show. So I'm, I'm really curious from a storytelling standpoint and Regis for you to weigh in on, on this as well. That's a real challenge having a main character who is so indecipherable and so, so, um, restrained. And so how do you approach that, especially, you know, over a 10 episode arc and keeping it interesting and keeping the audience engaged? Well, you know, it all started off with Evan Peters, really. His performance made it a, um, both captivating and distancing. You couldn't get inside his head all the time. You couldn't, there, there was nothing obvious. It was just super real and genuine. We can speculate on how damaged Dahmer was. We can speculate about his relationship with his father and his mother. And we, we see these things, but added up, it, it, it never really equates to the horror that this person was able to commit. And so, you know, we weren't trying to sensationalize anything. We weren't trying to humanize anything. And Evan crawled into a, a mindset that just gave you an, a very authentic, detached human as much as he was human. You know, a really damaged individual that you could just sort of watch plod through these things. And someone who couldn't really understand reactions from other people who were around him. And, and so... He made it really easy to track this character through his whole arc and see him move through this whole environment untouched by society and, and hiding in a marginalized society. You know, he, he was very selective in his choices, who he was killing, who he was attaching himself to. You know, monster doesn't just relate to the, to the guy with the knife. It relates to the society in which he was working within and how he was able to get away with what he was doing for so long and how people around him were marginalized and having to try to survive society and the mindset at that time, you know, dealing with the whole AIDS epidemic. People were being, were disappearing because of AIDS and it was a very convenient thing to be able to hide a mass murderer 
within that environment because people were disappearing and there weren't a whole lot of questions being asked at that time of where did these people go? And then we did the thing where we would we would examine and we, it really continues to be subtraction. It was, it was, I will, I remember we grappled with this actually in the first episode specifically with the first instance. Um, he goes to the bar. By all accounts, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer was seen as a sexy a sexy gay man or queer man um, that that was obviously a lot of men were attracted to a lot of people were attracted to even though he wasn't really personable and he was very odd and I remember that we had this great shot because we refused to ever go into his POV and we had this great shot where he looks in the mirror we called it our taxi driver moment and I remember saying to Regis one day I was like I think it looked I think he looks too good I, and it was as simple as that. I think he's too good looking in this moment. How can we look for another take? How can we get out of it sooner? I think that if we spend too too much time in it, what becomes sort of like the hero's gaze in a sense that that it starts to you start to sympathize. And and in that same that same scene, there was that dancing aspect where you start to feel bad for him. You you know because he was dancing and the guys were laughing at him. And and so it's about less. How could we? How could we sustain our story with less support of someone that uh, is still a movie star? You know, Evan is, is a movie star and Jeff is not. And so a lot of it was just actually looking at it from a really objective audience perspective of when is too much? And that was one of the biggest things that we had to talk about as we built it, because the show, as it went on, his character, you know, we both examine the past and grapple with what he's doing in the present. And he sort of becomes, um, I don't want to say grosser, but I mean, which he certainly does, Jeff, uh, Jeff the man, but he's even somehow less human as we continue to understand more of his life. And so I think it was really important to make sure in the first episode, we really and truly didn't spend too much time looking at him in any way other than um, with thoughtfulness as opposed to with empathy. Yeah, that's so well put. And and Regis, I, I I especially love the point that you were making about the historical context. And and again, that got, it gets back to my first question about like why tell this story? Well, because it's not about Dahmer. It's it's about so much more that's going on in that community and the racism and the homophobia. And it's just uh, it, it's just it's a very rich. It, it, it surprised me how what a rich tapestry you 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 found to explore. Uh, in this very um, disturbing story. Um, that credit goes back to the writers and to Ryan. I really, I think the scripts were brilliant. Ryan held everyone to such a standard, all of our writers, Ian and, and David McMillan and, and all of them, they really, really cared and really wanted it to be accurate and not forgiving, not, um, not a literal whitewashing of a scenario. Regis, as the as the supervising editor and and the producer of the show, and Alexis, I'm sure you 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 have a a perspective on this as well. One of the things that that struck me was just how remarkably consistent the tone is across the entire series, despite the fact that you're working with multiple directors who obviously have a very strong viewpoint about um, about storytelling, and you're working with multiple editors as well. So I'm I'm kind of curious about the process of making sure that there's a consistency in the tone across the arc of the entire series when you're working with all these different artists, and then. I, I have to say, like Regis, you you got a you got a great assignment on your own by by cutting episode one. Uh, I know, which is I feel like we could just teach a master class on building tension with the first part of of episode one. Which I want to we, we've got a clip from our friends at Netflix that that, I, that I'm going to show, and then we can dive into that. But before we get into that, I would love for you to just address that. How do you keep that consistency of the storytelling and the tone when you're working with all those different artists? Well, you know, a lot of that came through even in production, like Alexis was saying, you know, she was very instrumental along with Carl and Jason at talking through an approach, a very, it's a relatively simple approach, which is camera is moved by character or a little bit emotion, but Quite often, it was just following character physically. So, you know, we go handheld in with Tracy when Jeff was trying to finish off his final victim. But, you know, they kind of had a, a blueprint of trying to keep it real. Don't sensationalize the camera work. 
give us wide materials, wide shots, so that the audience can sort of take what they want from it. Don't force feed them, allow them the room to interpret. And, you know, along with Evan's performance, there's a lot of interpretation one can take from that because it wasn't so, it, there, nothing was sensationalized. And so, you know, through the series, you know, Alexis was on point, talking to the DP all the time, the directors. She had directors come in and and talk about the cuts that we had available at their t- when their rotation hit. So, you know, it's a um, – it was really a collaborative process to keep everybody in the same headspace. Tell us about the uh, building that first sequence. It's a very bold choice to begin the series, episode one of the of, of the series, with the the final victim who escapes and and uh, triggers Dahmer getting caught. So I, I made a note to myself when I watched it uh, that first sequence where where we're following uh, Dahmer trying to kill Tracy Edwards is I think is it's thirty seven minutes of the. F- of the that whole sequence is the first 37 minutes of the show and it was so tense it was so agonizing to watch it's just I, I, just virtuoso filmmaking can I listen to your heartbeat what The style in which it was shot drove the edit. So, you know, they went in there with this handheld, which was kind of a, a bold choice in a in a world in which everything was kind of contained and, and very motivated by by movement. But you know, It's really not hard to follow a performance and allow it to speak for itself and and motivate every cut based on when you're trying to rob the audience of what you don't want them to see and how to slip into the terror that Tracy was feeling in that room. You know, it was really a... um, dismal i mean you could almost smell it while you were cutting it just the way it was dressed and everything about that space um you know even the the fact that he was listening to the exorcist three or was it the exorcist three he was listening to at the same time as he's in this zone helped kind of cement this soundscape that was just so awful that it's almost hard to believe Tracy was able to to escape. Um, but as far as, let's see, how would you approach the editorial process on that? It's really just chasing the terror through the room. You followed eye lines. You kept it patient. You, you. It was really. It, I know that sounds so crazy. I'm not trying to speak for you, but I, I, because I speak for everyone. But I, but I do think that I know who I am. It's like I know I talk too much. But I, I think that Regis, uh, Regis will never want to gush about his own work the way I'll gush about Regis's work. But what I will say, and when I think about that, you were patient. You allowed him to be. You know, in the frame when they shot it, we kept him, especially in the beginning when he's cleaning off his drill and he's cracking the beer and you get the glimpses of all the grime in his life. He was dismembered himself. He was never in the frame. You know, his head was out of frame. And we didn't shoot it. I don't even think we had coverage with his head in the frame. But if we had, we just threw it out because it was about following the actions of the man, not the face of the man. And I think that, you know, I go back to 
one of the best moments with the patience of you had getting to let me listen to your heart before they lean back when 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 Tracy realizes that and I kept calling it was like Shahrazad like he had to do anything and tell stories in any way he could to stay alive but when he realizes that the only way that he can is going to have some power is through seduction is through appealing to what Jeff isn't expecting and he sucks on Jeff's finger which I still cannot think stop thinking about the grime on his finger. We just did this incredible detailed thing and I'm sure you've all noticed it at this point but for many people who watch it and don't understand how they're feeling that like the insides are being ripped out, you hear in the background from Exorcist 3 the soundtrack or the movies playing you hear someone screaming off, you know through the TV like screaming in terror as he sucks his finger and that's how I felt every time I watched it. And so I think that I think that you used eye lines patiently. You gave everyone a chance to follow what was happening so we could really be there as though we were the third party viewer in the room witnessing this. It wasn't proscenium, it wasn't a stage play. It was just, we got to patiently observe it. And Regis, who I've always said, he'll, he knows what the film is telling you. Even, even if you don't know what, if, you know, other, so in someone else's hands, it would have been different. He patiently says, well, the film is telling me where to cut. I know where this is supposed to go. So I, I will praise him till the cows come home. Well, I'm glad you did that, Alexis, because I, I have a feeling, you know, Regis is being too modest for his impact on Way the show. Way too modest. <laughs> but, so one of the things that just, of course, the way my mind and my ears work that leapt out at me from the opening moments of that first episode is how important sound is to the storytelling on this on this show. And of course, the thing that I, I noticed from that very first couple of minutes is how you're using you're withholding from the audience. We know that there's something horrific happening, but we're not seeing it. We're hearing the sound coming into Glenda's apartment next door through the air vents. And it's such, it's such a, a, a powerful way to use sound as a storytelling tool uh, to contribute to that. Uh, you know, we're not seeing, but we're hearing. So Laura, tell me about that idea, and obviously that was written into the scripts, and Amanda, you and the crew shot it that way. But when that came to you as a mixer, what a what a great opportunity for you to really be very specific and make some truly horrifying choices about how to mix that sequence uh, and to tell the story through sound. And and actually, I'll be honest, we actually mixed that opening scene. It must have been eight, nine, ten times, and. The first time we did it, it actually was uh, more gruesome. That whole first episode was the um, first time we did it. Um, before Regis and Alexis came in, it was much more flashier. There was much more sound design in it. It was um, it's more of a thing. And when we played it back, we just realized this didn't feel right. We wanted something more authentic. We wanted something more realistic. So we ended up paring it down quite a bit. Um, and that's obviously what you hear now, but we wanted the intent to really be focused on, on the actors and Nisi Nash is so good that your, your focus is on her, that the sound we got away with something pretty subtle because you see her wince and you, I mean, the audience already knows if you know the Jeffrey Dahmer story, you know, what she's listening to and the payoff is in, you know, the next shot you see Dahmer with, um, with the knife. So we were able to be really subtle with it which was not our first approach um but with Regis and Alexis we ended up realizing that actually holding back actually was more impactful and that actually all got discovered on the stage um Gary our sound soup and um Bruce Tannis our effects that are cut amazing stuff and so we just had this bed to just sit in and especially in his um in Dahmer's apartment you have Alexis said you've got the uh the fish tank there's the fridge, there's the freezer, there's the lights. And so there's just all this tonal elements that just add weight and kind of claustrophobia feeling. And so that's just kind of played in throughout, but very subtle, but it is all there to kind of feel the weight of what, of what Dom was doing and to kind of, you know, see what he's thinking and everything. I, I, I want to dig into that and follow up with a, a little bit more. You're talking about like the, you know, the fish tank and the refrigerator and these, as you say, these rich tonal elements, but you also are creating space for those very subtle sounds to be heard and to express themselves. And I would, the, the other thing that I noticed uh, obviously is the remarkable score uh, in, in the film. 
which also is very is very tonal and and expressive and 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 very disconcerting and troubling. But I would love for you to talk about Laura your process about working with the music and kind of balancing the music with the sound design to create that very troubling dark darkness of tone. Yeah, uh, our dialogue uh, mixers were uh, Jamie Hart and Joe Barnett, and they did so great with the music. The music is uh, it's from the cave, and it's fantastic, all very tonal. So our effects kind of wanted to mirror that, kind of go along with it. And so really just kind of not pushing anything, letting even the music just kind of be a bed for everything. But the biggest thing is obviously tones just can't sit there, especially since you're in Dahmer's apartment for, as you said, a very long time. So it's kind of trying to find a balance of weaving stuff in and out so you know it doesn't just lay flat and you kind of can pull in the audience to focus on certain things when he does certain something, you know, different or to focus on Tracy. So it's really just trying to find a, a constant balance throughout all these little, you know, details. Amanda, you've been so patient. I want to hear about the, I want to hear about the production uh, and the production process uh, on, on the show. Now I, I'm, I'm presuming that you had a lot of location work um, on the show. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that Dahmer's apartment and Glenda's apartment were probably, those were built sets, but was the rest, most everything else was practical locations? Uh, also, uh, Dahmer's grandmother's house, the interior of that was also on stage, um, as well as the basement um, at, at his grandmother's house that was also on stage as well. Um, and then we did have, yeah, I mean, there was a good amount of location work, um, obviously, um, certain locations that we would come back to frequently, though. So we kind of had like a, a home base, um, you know, of his childhood home, as well as, you know, um, when he's in the military, that location doubled for a couple of different things. So um, you know, we would, we would get very, um, we would live in a certain location for a while and get very accustomed to it. And, and the, you know, the uh, peculiarities of like how to get in and out of a space and how noisy a space may be. We had a lot of trains, um, which, we, which, you know, we weren't expecting, I think, in certain locations. Were we in Riverside? Were we in Riverside or Fullerton? I can't, we were in Riverside, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We big were, yeah. yeah. When we were there for weeks. Yeah. yeah. That, you, you killed that location. Yeah. You killed it. Um, Cause there were trains but, everywhere. Yeah. Um, but it was, I think, the best part, I mean, what to, to sort of relate back to what we were talking about, what Laura was talking about, because I actually knew going into it, I, it had been told to me that Nick Cave was most likely doing the score for it and being aware of sort of his, you know, quality of music. And then knowing that, obviously, in the in the apartment set, Fish Tank was real, Fridge and Freezer, obviously, were not plugged in on the day, so we didn't have to deal with them. But I was very acutely aware of that these would be things that would be added back into the final soundtrack of the piece. And so... The fact that we were in a controlled environment for Jeff's apartment and Glenda's apartment meant that I could really focus on getting really clean, solid, amazing production tracks of anything from a grunt, you know, a whisper, you know, let me hear your heartbeat, these quieter moments, as well as screams and terror and all of that. We could get very clean, very amazing things because I knew that there was going to be a lot of layering, most likely, that would happen in post. And so I just wanted to make sure that for our part of it, we were capturing those performances as cleanly and as you know as high quality as we possibly could, just to make sure that what we were we were sending over to post would be you know as as useful as possible. Um, because yeah, there's some moments. Um, I mean, obviously Tracy is shirtless for a lot of of when he's in the apartment. Um, a lot of wide shots, like is mentioned, and so you can't rely necessarily on well, we'll just lob them up and we'll play that in the wide. In this case, we had to get pretty creative. My, I had such an incredible team. My boom operator Zach got really good at working out where the shadows would be from all the practical lights that were in there and just sneaking in there and working with the camera operators, um, working with Jason, um, and as well as then my utility. We called him the gardener. This has been a long-term nickname. We've worked together for many years. He's really good at placing plant mics, that's gardening, um, but he, we would anywhere and anywhere, we will stick a mic behind a couch, under a seat cushion, in front of a table, because it's, my thought is always that there should never be a dead space we should always make sure that we're giving something. You can always not use it, you can always take it away, but there should be no reason why we're not just getting every little pocket you know, of the room you know, recorded. Because even when it's silent, it's not silent. So you know, we always wanna make sure we're picking up you know, whatever we can. Um, and of course, good room tone of the fish tank. <laughs> The fish tank, you have no idea. We spent so much time on the fish tank. Oh my God. <laughs> Art department, sound department, camera, like we all obsessed over the fish tank. 
Yeah, because those things are noisy. They can be when they when they're when they're on and the bubbles are <laughs> the way that of course visually are you know everyone always wanted to see. So it was kind of my job to kind of be like, oh hey, the fish tank is in the shot. Let's turn it off. And it was oh, oh right, okay, we'll turn off the fish tank. You know, so I kind of had to had to you know be that person. <laughs> but we worked. I mean, set deck was amazing, and Jason obviously was very you know aware of the fact that, and all the directors too that you know were. I'm, I'm asking those questions. I'm, I'm seeing what we can do to, to change the space because I want to make sure that what we're getting is going to help best tell the story and not detract from the actor's performance because that's the main goal is to not have to re-record something later. When Evan is there and Nisi is there and they are in the headspace and they've done the work, the last thing that I want to do is be the reason why we can't you know, utilize that performance because they're giving it 110, then we need to make sure we're recording it at the utmost. As well as recording recording off-camera coverage as well. So they're constantly get grabbing everybody's performance quality level, whether they're on camera or not. So it was always a great tool to be able to go to all of the various angles that they recorded. It was great. I mean, I think it used to be, I mean, I think that overlap used to be a very dirty word in, in production sound. I think there was always the assumption that, you know, get everything clean, no overlap, no, or watch the overlap. I mean, even I think at the start of my career, I mean, I feel like watch the overlap would have been one of the most said things, I feel like, as far as in relation to, to production sound and or a note that we would give to a director. And I really love how things have changed um, now to the point where, because, I mean, Television obviously has, has grown so much as far as the medium and the things that we are doing, I mean, it looks cinematic. It needs to sound just as good. And performances are natural and live. And this isn't, you know, a stage play. This is something where things are, you know, they're yelling all over each other. Um, I mean, I guess it is like a stage play in that regard because they're yelling all over each other. And just because we're cutting to a close up doesn't mean that someone should drop off in the background. So I think that's become something that I've really embraced as a production sound mixer. And I think the shows that I've worked on obviously have lent themselves to that. But I know every now and then I'll get a, a script supervisor or a director. Hey, should we be concerned about the overlap here? And it's like, no, we're going to cover it in a way that you can utilize it. And I think that your performances are going to be better because of it. So it sometimes is a little bit more work on our part, but I think that what we get out of it is absolutely, it's worth it every time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the things that also just struck me uh, about the show was the the uh, attention to historical detail and and accuracy, and one of the one of the clips that we've got is uh, from uh, episode eight, and it's the victim statements uh, from the courtroom. Why did this happen to a person like Eddie? He gave so much and asked for so little. All he wanted was a chance to be himself. When you killed my brother. You killed my mother and father. Amanda, tell me about shooting that day and about uh, about how you approached that courtroom set. I mean, we definitely took it upon ourselves. We we did, you know, do some research, and I did obviously look up as much as I could as far as what we were basing it off of. I know we had um, big boards on the day that were in the courtroom that were, you know, stills from the actual courtroom, like from the video footage and the, the photography that had been taken on the day. And then obviously there were our characters as well. And there were very key shots that I know that, that they were working on recreating. So we did kind of have this sort of storyboard, so to speak, of these of these actual moments that they were trying to. And it was definitely very eerie because you see very clear. I mean, you know, you look at this shot and you, there would be the person in costume. And, and it was pretty it was pretty surreal. Um, uh, so that was pretty you know crazy. I know I worked with the with props and with set deck um for anything where we were trying to make sure that you know things looked accurate but we wanted to use working mics as much as possible so we did work together in that regard but i mean that that was very much yeah it was it was a very surreal day because of the fact that it it was i mean some of those performances it's amazing i mean it, it's just i think the the actors really did their homework that day and so again same thing we showed up to get it as clean and as good as possible, but definitely it was nice. I mean, the, the interdepartmental, you know, relationships on the show were fantastic. I mean, the, the conversations that I had with props, with our department, they were always just so great. We always kind of, what can I do to help? And are you looking for that specific mic? Let me try and source it for you or they'll try and source. So, but yeah, it was just about, you know, realistic and, and making it as, as true to the actual courtroom scene, you know, the courtroom moments as possible because that was the goal. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I think I mentioned to you uh, before we got started that, you know, in addition to our professional audience, we have a lot of film students and and young film fans who tune in to the Dolby podcast. So I'm always thankful for an opportunity to talk to a production sound mixer because I want to encourage young people to think about this as a possible career path. And I, I for me, one of the things I've always been just fascinated by about your, you know, your job is this sense of, you know, I, I can't think of any show in recent memory that has more powerful performances from actors than than is in this one. And you're there and you're one of the people who has some of the most intimate contact with the actors. You're you and your team are miking them up when they when they go to set. You, you you're putting a you know a boom pole in their face to record these very quiet, intimate, you know, as you said, that that just chilling line, you know, I want to listen to your heart. Like you capture that. So tell me about your approach to working with actors. Because obviously, if you're shooting something like Dahmer, they're in a very specific, delicate mental state to to give performances like that. And so, tell me about your how you approach working with the actors. I mean, obviously, every every you know project could be slightly different, but I will say at least um, with with the with the group of people that I work with, I mean, we definitely take it very seriously that we're not there to distract from you know the work that they need to do in any way. And so it's being respectful of them, of their space. In this particular case, obviously with Evan, um, you know, very much so if he was there, he was on set and he's in character, it was, you go in, you get him wired. There's no small talk. It's, you know, you're just getting in, you're getting it done. Um, and Zach, my boom op is very good at, you know, he'll have a quick side conversation with a camera operator, not something sort of loud that could be, oh, hey guys, sound needs another, you know, we're not going to yell anything like that out. If there is an issue, it's a quick side conversation. We have ways to get to, you know, I can talk to the director quietly in their ear. Hey, you know what? I can't really, I'm having a really hard time understanding Evan. Is that a concern for story or do we want to go with that take? I'm happy, you know, I can talk to them. We can have these quick little moments that don't, that way the actors don't ever hear us discussing things that could potentially take them out of it or inform the next take, you know, we're, we're meant to be silent and out of the way. And so that's, that's really what we, what we did on this one was, you know, we stayed out of their way. Um, the first, you know, my unlucky, I mean, safe my utility within the first day, he had figured out a really solid placement for Evans wire. That's the key thing. We want to do it as quickly and as, as you know, you know, you know, not getting in their in their face for multiple changes. Let me tweak this or whatever. And so, within the first you know few days, we pretty much had it dialed in with most of the our main cast, and that was pretty nice because then it was just you know get it done. It was real quick. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 being professional. You know, I mean, I feel like that's that's all it is at, at its at its core. I mean, it's they're there to do a job, and we shouldn't be getting in their way. So that's that's what we do. Yeah. Well, and I feel like now that you've said, I, I feel like I, I need to give a shout out to Richard Jenkins and his performance, especially in those scenes, interrogation scenes with the with the police when he's being told what's happened. Like it's just an ext extraordinary performances all around with this cast. Unbelievable work, Richard. Out of all of them, I think Richard for the crew on set. There were days in which Richard would finish a take, and people in the room were just. Oh, like that. I mean, that was some powerful stuff from Richard, especially, I mean, the stuff when he first learns of who his son is. Um, I mean, I want to say that was probably take one or two. Like, I mean, he was out the gate just nailing it. And I think all of us in the room were just kind of blown away by that. Extraordinary. Well, I, you know, the show is so it's so agonizing and emotional to watch. What, what was it like on set? Was this a was this a lighthearted set or, you know, you, Alexis and Amanda, how were those days? I mean, Amanda, I got the benefit with all of the shows. I was dabbling in and out. I had like six shows going at the same time. Amanda was in it. And I know it was a heavy show. I, I will say from the outset, as, as the EP and as, as a, I'm a very emotionally available person, I was so proud of what the crew went through because it's just, it was difficult content. It, we wanted to be so respectful of what we were examining and, and, and specifically to the victims and to the victims' families and, and to Dahmer's family, and um, it's it was intense. I know that they were in it and, and did a beautiful job, but I don't want to say, I would never say that it was an unhappy set. I just know that it was an intense set. It was quiet. It was thoughtful. Uh, but Amanda had the day-to-day -day grind of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think that, definitely, there were some days, obviously, that were even heavier um, than others, um, especially with Conrack, with, with the scenes with him, um, the Synthanthophone family, like, that stuff was pretty heavy um but uh 
we, I think as a crew, like I said, we, we all got along really well, which is always fantastic. Um, you know, these are some people I had worked with before, people I hadn't worked with before. Um, but I think there was a general sense of everyone kind of having each other's backs. I know that at least within my department, you could tell maybe someone was having like a harder time or a harder day and you would give them that space and be there and allow them, you know, do you need a moment or, you know, or if they were kind of beating themselves up about something. It was like, it was just kind of giving each other the space to like be humans and have human reaction to the, to the subject matter um, and to not, you know, be overly upset about any one little thing. I mean, at the end of the day, it is, it's a television show, but because of the subject material, I mean, there definitely were days you know, where you'd kind of, at lunch, you could kind of, you know, kind of feel it. But I think everyone generally was there for each other. I think we would kind of, you know, we kept it respectful for the actors, but certainly amongst ourselves, like we could find these moments of brevity and like, you know, and, and so there was that. Never anything, I mean, like I said, everyone was so incredibly respectful of, especially the victims, families and all of that. But we kind of would have our own little silly like side things that, that we would do to kind of like keep spirits up and whatnot. So, you know, it, it ended up being, you know, cause it was a long haul. I think it was almost six months of principal photography. Um, so, so yeah, so it, you know, so you kind of, you find those little things that like, you know, you know, get you through and everyone, you know, yeah, kind of had each other's backs. That was the main thing. There's so much extraordinary sound work uh, in, in, in the show, but I, I want to take a moment and focus on episode six, which I, I just think is just extraordinary work. Um, this is this is the episode where Dahmer uh, almost kind of falls in love with Tony Hughes and ultimately uh, uh, murders him. And of course, Tony is deaf. And so we spend a lot of time with Tony and his family and his social circle um, where he's, you know, you know, you know, using sign language to communicate. And, uh, it's always a sort of a pet peeve of mine when people say like, oh, you had all these, these silent scenes in, in, in the show. And it was like, it's not silent. There's, there's a lot of very interesting sound work going on. It's just not the sound work that you might expect to, to, to hear. So I would love, uh, Laura, for you to just talk, talk to us about crafting the sound specifically, um, for that episode. And, and I thought it was just such a, a, a just a, a bold move to have some of those long dialogue sequences where they're signing to each other and we're hearing what's going on. Uh, but you know, uh, but it, you let it play out. And then there's a lot of work that you do to create Tony's sound POV that I'd love for you to kind of unpack for us. So yes, the, those are some very long scenes, especially when he's with his uh, friends at the restaurant. And um, that was Regis and Alexis's idea was to keep it, you know, quite silent, that whole scene. And I, I think on the stage, all the sound people were like, huh, that, that's a long time. <laughs> um, so it, it was a bold move. I, I do think it worked because you wanted to be, you want to be with Tony in those scenes rather, you know, versus like watching Tony. So that was kind of our whole, I think, objective was when you're with Tony's POV, you want to be with him. You want to be experiencing and kind of moving around as he would, you know, experience the world as much as, you know, a hearing person could. And I think another goal was to always use um, something from his environment for all the transitions. We never really used whooshes or anything, you know, out an outside element. It always had to be something. You know, like the glass is clinking or, you know, the thumping of his hand. It always had to be something in that context to kind of pull you in and out. And, you know, yes, there is certainly stuff playing underneath those, you know, silent things. And it's, you know, it's just adding a little bit of a weight and kind of it's like a bubbly kind of thing. It was kind of so you could kind of move around in Tony's, you know, so to speak, his bubble. He's in his own, you know, bubble with his friends. And it, our hope was that it hopefully pulled you in so you were more connected with Tony because it's, I mean, he's amazing in that episode that you just want to be with him 
at the end, end, you're hoping for obviously a different result than what does happen. But it was our hope that you would just connect with him more. Yeah, and Laura, that's so beautifully said. And and there's a line when you're in the pizza parlor early on with Tony as his friend, when he says he's going to be a model and his friends, you know, they're giving each other shit. And, and it was really important to us to have a sign language consultant working with us to paraphrase the, the words on the page the right way that it that a deaf person would actually interpret it, not just translating what we were writing. So that the, so it was, there's a real accuracy to what we were, or that we were attempting, like, you know, forgive us if we were inaccurate. The goal was to be as accurate as possible. Um, but one of his friends basically says to him, you're black, deaf, and gay, and you think you're going to be a model? You know, good luck. And the idea for Regis and I and our editor, Taylor Mason, who is just brilliant on this episode, the idea is, we don't even see Dahmer for like 20 minutes into the episode. You know, you're really with Tony. So if we're supposed to be experiencing Tony's experience, if we're supposed to be with Tony and he is, has the odds stacked against him, he's black, deaf, and gay in a time when that is just not a great trifecta to, to it's your challenging trifecta, I should say, then we have to do justice to what Tony's life is. How are we supposed to be, at, I mean, we'll be devastated no matter what. The story is tragic no matter what that happened to Tony Hughes. But if we aren't completely in love with him, with who he is as a fully realized person, and if he's a fully realized person who can't hear, well, that's not a flaw. That's just part of who he is. We need to know that. Sorry, I get very passionate. This is me in the screening room. I get real crazy. But it is so important that that it, that the audience, you know, for Glenn, for you to feel so strongly about this, and I think so many viewers felt so strongly about the episode. And again, it goes back to what Ryan and the writers really, really believed in, we have to understand Tony first. And so that means you have to take the bold swing. And so we did use the transitions. We, when we push through, there's a camera push through the kitchen in the pizza parlor and we push through sound into silence. And we loved the, I mean, I lived for telling me just like, turn up. I love the hand gestures when you could get those touches, just like the mouth noises here and there that, you know, that just the little, the kisses of what you would hope to hear as texture, um, because texture is just as important as, you know, leading sound. And so it really came down to, if I don't know Tony the way I, the way Tony deserves to be known, how am I going to care when Tony is, how am I going to feel the same things? And so we, we really spent a lot of time and we, we, again, built it up and pulled it down and built it up and pulled it down and always sculpting, always. And Amanda, kudos to you for capturing all that texture. So, so well during production. I mean, my major thanks to, I think there are other directors, there are other shows that could have looked at an episode like that and would have put us on the back burner that would have said, you can take a step back. You know, this is a visual episode, um, but we were still allowed to, we wired up Tony, um, you know, uh, we, we boomed the shot. The pizza parlor was great. We left normally in, a, in an environment like that, turn off refrigerators, turn off ice machines. We left everything just full on like it would in a, in a restaurant, had the background do crosses, had them clink their glasses. The BG were allowed to not talk, obviously, but do mo- motion that normally we would we would relax on. But we wanted all of that atmosphere. We wanted all of that, you know, the environment to be real. And so we were allowed to record all of that. Um, I think the, the most interesting thing that we did was we did put a mic on the interpreter, on the ASL interpreter, so that he would sit off camera next to the director. And as the actors would sign, he would speak quietly what they were signing. The goal was to hopefully help editorial, because if you don't know ASL, you may miss if like that was, a you know, something was missigned. Um, and so obviously you wouldn't want to use that take. And so there, the interpreter was actually live uh, translating everything that happened, which we just record. That was just for editorial that we knew that would never be obviously utilized in the show, but just something to try and help out editorial. Laura, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, you mixed this in Dolby Atmos. And, and you know, I, I think that typically a lot of a lot of Producers, I will say, no, no, no offense, Alexis. A lot of producers I'm already say, offended. <laughs> a lot of producers will say, we don't, you know, we don't have big action sequences. You know, what do we, what, what would we need Dolby Atmos for in a story like this? But uh, tell me about how you used Atmos for the storytelling in Dahmer. Yeah, so we mixed home Atmos, um, and you know, yeah, it's not used in the same way I would use it for an action movie. It's not, you know, stacked to the walls or anything. But what it what Home Atmos does do is it gives you, it allows for space and it allows for um, movement. So like in the club, um, especially during, I think the, the Tony scenes, you know, the music is you're completely engulfed in, in the music. And that's what 
Atmos said to do um, with backgrounds, since we relied heavily on backgrounds for long scenes and to just add character. Um, you're pretty much, it can put you in that space. Um, Atmos was also useful for um, like that opening scene for the vent. Um, we treated that as an object and it actually is up in the ceiling and it kind of, you know, it does move with you as she, you know, as the camera pans towards it. So it allows for, for movement and space, which is required in, you know, any kind of storytelling. So yes, it's not used in the same way as we usually would, but it's great that they understood that we needed it and we definitely use it. And it then it works great when you pair it down to five, one, two track and it's great. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much. You've been very patient. I know I've gone a little bit long, but there was just so much to unpack with this show. And uh, it's been such a such an honor to have you all uh, come on come on the Dolby podcast. You know, I, I have to say I felt very conflicted by the end. You know, Dahmer is such a monster, but I, I, I e even, you know, watching his end was very emotional. It's a it's a tough it, you, you guys set some very tough narrative uh, goals for yourself, but it's a, it's just remarkable storytelling. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you to everyone. I mean, what a great team. I mean, I, Evan, it's Evan, Evan, Evan. And then everyone who it, it is, and he's, you know, I've worked with him for 12 years now. And I, I've always said, you don't have to cut Evan. You never have to cut Evan. And we finally got a show that we was patient enough that we did not, we did, we could let Evan do what Evan needed to do. And he was our, I think everyone's guiding light through the show. So um, my gratitude starts there, but everyone on the, on the Zoom just has done beautiful work and, and everyone on the crew did beautiful work. So we're really grateful. Thank you for caring. Absolutely. It's been, an, it's been a pleasure to have you guys on to talk about it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many thanks once again to Regis, Amanda, Laura, and Alexis for joining us today. And thanks again to our friends at Netflix for putting this conversation together and for providing us with those clips. Dahmer is currently streaming on Netflix in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. And as always, we have a link to the show in our show notes. And don't forget to check out our second podcast episode on Dahmer when I sit down with the series director, Paris Barclay, that will premiere this coming Thursday. If you'd like even more conversations with artists and filmmakers about how they use technology to tell their stories, please be sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms, including our video version on YouTube and our show notes. Or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, head on over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information about all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, thanks again for joining us. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. I am your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for watching. <laughs>